Is our reality a simulation? An actual matrix? Can we finally prove there's life after death? And what about this alien UFO thing, really? There's a lot of cool, smart people working on this stuff, and I'm talking to them. Let's take the time to really explore bigger questions. This is perhaps one of the last multi-camera interviews with the late Stuart Wilde. And he's like known as the father of metaphysics. And when I sat down with him, we had this instant connection. And it was almost like the universe was telling me things that I needed to hear through him. One of the things he was talking about before the interview started was redemption. We're all here for redemption. I wasn't really sure what he meant. So that's where we started. Hi, I'm Ron James, and I'm very privileged to be sitting here with Stuart Wilde. Stuart is the author of over 20 books in the subject of metaphysics, with publishers such as Hay House. He's been writing these books for a long time. He's considered one of the world's foremost experts. Stuart, you're literally a modern-day mystic. Your experiences and what you've chosen to do with those experiences are like a shining beacon for people on their own spiritual path. So maybe we talk a little bit about how average people can work on their own redemption? The first tenant of their redemption, the first move they have to make, is they have to begin to become introspective. They've got to look at themselves, rather than being massively busy and rushing around and being in denial. So you have to be aware of what you've created and what energies you put out. And You know, let's say for example, if you have a lust for power, you may not be aware of that because the lust of, for power blinds you. Because all lust for power comes from self-obsession. So it's really a manifestation of one's obsession with self. So you've got to look at that and begin to understand it. And that comes from quiet time. And it comes from introspection. It comes from trance, meditation. You have to get in touch with, like, who am I? Deep down, who am I? Not am I some great chosen something or other, you know, the great, you know, poo on the hill. Uh, you know, deep down, what have I created in this life? How much goodness, how much kindness? How much do I focus on other people's needs and how much do I focus upon myself? Am I a predator? You know, financial predator, sexual predator? Do I have endless amounts of unexpressed anger, repressed anger, let's say, for example? which is very common, especially like in a crumbling economy. And that's the first place. The first place is to want to evolve. You know, how much do you want to become free? And I said in one of my very early books, I said, imagine if you're swimming along in a pool and like this being from the below swamp thing grabs you by the ankle and pulls you down. How hard will you fight or swim to break free to get back to the oxygen? of the fresh air above. And so we have to deeply want to be free. You've got to want to be free. And part of that journey is back inside through your soul to look at who you are. Now, before we go on, let's, uh, let's define redemption. Because we think that, especially in contemporary beliefs, a lot of people are like, well, I don't need to be redeemed. I'm perfect just the way I am. I'm having the perfect experience. Where I am right now is right where I should be doing what I should be doing. And so redemption sometimes has a air about the word that sounds like, oh, I've done terrible things and I must be redeemed. But just some of the human qualities that you were talking about are things that, that as we evolve, we, we try to work through. So can we kind of define what redemption means to you? I do understand how redemption has a sort of born again Christian patina to it. But essentially, it's a redemption from pain. It's a redemption from emotion. It's a redemption from the sense of restriction, the sense of control. So it's a redemption from frustration and from just that malaise that people suffer from. 
it's a redemption from hard work. I mean, sometimes redemption is nothing more than throwing the mother-in-law off the roof and realizing, hey, this bitch is driving me nuts. I need to get rid of her. <laughs> I mean, not literally, <laughs> but you just say, listen, darling, I think you're fantastic. And we're now, not why, advocating any felonies. Yeah, yeah, now why don't you move to Utah and leave me alone? You know, I'm going to Fiji. <laughs> um, so it's just a matter of looking at what restricts you, what frustrates you, what creates negative emotions. And then what stresses you out, what makes you edgy, nervous, frenetic, um, unloving, uncaring, unaware, unconscious. And then in the end you become Stone Buddha. You could be there in a war and you won't flinch. So, so now that people maybe have a better understanding of what we mean by, by yeah. the redemption, let's get back to the personal steps that, that people can take. Well, meditation is important. I'm a great believer in vegetarianism, but I'm not fagging my wing at meat eaters, you know? But because we live inside the nature spirit of the earth, I mean, we're linked to the animals and the plants, and the spirit of the earth, um, Lovelock called it Gaia, you know? So we, we worship Gaia in the sense that she is the mother of all things. So I advocate vegetarianism because I just find it hard to comprehend people evolving as meat eaters, because if you kill our animals, you've already gone on the wrong side of her. So, and I've not met anybody, and this is a true statement, I've not met anybody that's highly evolved, that has very, very acute perception, or a great light inside of them that's a meat eater. So, we suggest vegetarianism, we suggest meditation, we now, when you talk about vegetarianism, are you talking about complete vegetarianism? Well, or some vegetarians like to eat fish and so on periodically, mm -hmm. you know. A lot of the fish is sort of glowing green nowadays, you know, because of Fukushima. I've heard that. Yeah, but um, yeah, fish is okay because my old teacher said that the animals are different because they come in contact with humans and so mm -hmm. they develop identities and souls, even if the farmer is just feeding them and then he kills them. But they still, they have a connection where the fish live in this place where the humans don't exist. And so they don't have this evolution that the, that the, that the land-based animals have. So, okay. So, so it's not the same spiritual implications eating, eating from the ocean? No, it's not the same spiritual implication. And then calm, and then I, I talk in my book um, about the three graces. And the three graces are tenderness, generosity and respect. So tenderness is having a sensibility for the needs of others. Generosity is not necessarily giving people money. It's a generosity of spirit. So helping the community, being there for people, being kind to the children, being protector of the children. And then respect is to sort of allow all the people that are absolutely ghastly to be as ghastly as they want to be. And I have a concept in my books called Tea with Hitler. And I say, hey, can you have tea with Hitler? And not judge him, not talk about the war, just sit there and have a tea with this German gentleman, well, Austrian gentleman, and um, talk about Tibet and art and his dog and not make him wrong. And if you can do that and you can have tea with Hitler, then you're free. Because that way, even the worst tyrant, you're free, of, you're free, you're completely free. So I tell people, love your tormentors. Love your tormentors, don't hate people, love them. And the third grace is respect, and that's respecting everybody, every last mother and son and child in the world, and respecting all the people you hate, and all the people that are violent and nasty and ghastly. And um, it comes from a concept in my book that I call Tea with Hitler. Can you sit there and have tea with this absolutely atrocious man and not talk about his crimes and make him wrong? Can you talk about Tibet and art, who's interested in that, and his dog, and just sit there and be normal and be equitable? So essentially it comes into extremes of non-judgment and, 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 and not be critical of people and not whinge and moan and complain and so forth, because all of those are like manifestations of an inner disquiet. So I say to people like, if you're at the bus stop and the bus doesn't come and it starts to rain, then just agree to do rain.
just say, I'm sitting here doing rain, and not react. So it takes people into a higher level of understanding that life comes to you. Sometimes it's beautiful, sometimes it's perfect, and sometimes it's belting down with rain and you've got a flat tire. So you just do rain, that's it. You agree to be wet. So I tell people, hey, it's all right to be scared, it's all right to be lonely, it's all right to be frustrated, it's all right to be angry, as long as you process all this stuff. And that way you become very, very calm because you do not expect it to go in any particular way. How about, give us an example of, of practical processing. Practical processing is first you have to become aware of the emotion that you created because you've got to understand that when you're being spiteful, you're laying this lime green onto another person. So you have to be aware of the damage you've caused. And then you've got to be aware of the fact that it isn't the best sentiment for you because it'll bring danger to you. So hateful people suffer hateful karma. So once you get involved in thinking about what karma are you, am I creating at the moment by, say, shouting at the taxi driver, um, there's a bad karma in that. Even if he cut you up, let him cut you up. And I tell people, if you're in the line of the supermarket and people are in a rush, step back and let them go. You've got all the time in the world because you're eternal. So if you're playing a game of chess, make a really stupid move and lose. You know, if you're playing football, drop the pass. If you're playing in goal, you know, dive in the wrong direction. Agree to be last, agree to lose. Because it's part of the ego's need to sort of triumph over people. But again, that's a sort of devilish sentiment. So I'd be hopeless at the Olympics, because I mean, I wouldn't even get out of the blocks, you know. They'd be up the road and then gone home back to Jamaica before I even made it to the finish line. Agree to lose, agree to be last, agree to be nothing, because all of these things instill humility. And in the end, one of the great powerhouses of your spiritual journey, beyond processing your shadow and being kind to people, is to develop humility. That's vital. So I think that people might be unclear at this point about being nothing when, like for instance, in your career you've written 20 books, you've done an amazing amount of work, and so somebody might say, well, if you agree to be nothing, then you're not going to do those kind of things. So well, help people separate Well, it, it's really um, to be defined in the sense of like agree not to be important. So you can get deep inside your God force and create paintings and art and tapestries and films and books and or you work with children, but you don't set an importance to it. It's just what you do, do you follow me? It's like the cheetah that runs at 40 miles an hour. She isn't important, she's just busy doing lunch for her children. And it's the same with that inner, the inner world, come, the creativity is vast in those inner worlds. And as it comes out of you, you don't want to be making it too special and too like, look at me, I'm a great musician. You know, any twig can play the guitar, and we're not looking at you, you know? Just intuit your beauty, and the guitar was sounds extraordinary. So it's it's a uh, it's another exercise in separating the ego from the the higher exactly, self. Exactly. Yeah. Is that the being special and the need to get recognition and to feel important? That's all ego based. But yeah. the ability to express artistically that is a yeah. channeling or a, or a yeah. um, uh, expression of, of the higher. Yeah. Universe. If you're channeling if you're channeling the energies, you'll do it really quick. You know. And um, I met with some people today, a very famous music producer, and I had to write a song. And I wrote that song in less than two minutes. And I went downstairs and I said, here's your song. He loved it. It's called The Promise. I, but I, that's I not because <laughs> I'm a genius. It's just because if you're in touch with your inner soul, if you're in touch with that divinity, the song is already written mm -hmm. because actually we're drifting backwards in time. So the book exists before you lay down the first word. All you're doing is filling in the gaps to the end of the book. And it's the same with the song. The song pre-exists you. It's already there. The song has been there since the universe began. It's just at the point where you discover the song, you sing it. So it, it's not like you have to think it through. If you're thinking, then it can be kind of a tedious thing. 
Now you mentioned that we're moving backwards through time. I, yeah. Is time an illusion, or is it? Yes. it are things all happening simultaneously, They're or all, is there a, a, a linear? No, you're completely right. Everything's happening simultaneously, all at the same time. So the end is the beginning, and the beginning is the end. So it's a Mobius strip, which looks like a sideways eight. Mm -hmm. Most people are familiar with that. And when you're going this way, you're going forwards in time. And as you come around the corner, you're going backwards in time. And then when you come around this corner, you're going forwards in time. And when you're going around the other way, you're going backwards in time. So you're going through this eternal loop that looks like a sideways eight. As we, uh, as we process what you're talking about as far as redemption, um, let's talk about vibrational frequencies and how the human body vibrates in this 3D plane, in this reality, in this frequency. As you, as you work on your own redemption and you work on your own spiritual evolution, does your actual physical vibration change? Very much so. It goes faster and faster and faster. It's not up in an elevated sense. So the idea of higher beings isn't totally right. There are wider beings. So what you're trying to do is let go and develop less and less and less restrictions and parameters and get wider and wider and wider. As you get wider, the outer edge of what you are, which let's say could be described by my hands right now, begins to bleed into these other worlds, into these other dimensions. So somebody that's like very, very wide would be 30 miles wide. But in the 30 miles, given that the other dimension starts there, I mean, the lunar mirror world's there, and then you've gone 30 miles beyond there. And so it's wideness, and wideness means a compassion to be all-encompassing and to live a balanced life. And again, I'm not wagging the finger, but people know when they're dysfunctional. They know when they're taking too many drugs or they're getting too angry or they're drinking too much or they're taking too many risks, let's say, you know, driving fast on the freeway when you're drunk. So. so it's a matter of balance. It's always a matter of balance. And in that softness and in that calm, you soon become aware when you aren't balanced. And what we're trying to do is we're trying to return back to our natural self before the programming. So suffer little children to come unto me, as it says in the Bible, is very accurate because they don't have a mind yet, you know? They were natural. So you're looking to become natural. So that requires you to be truthful to be able to say what you want, to, you know, it allows you to say what you mean and mean what you say. To, so to be able to go through uncomfortable moments with people. And I tell people, look, if it's uncomfortable for you to say something, start by telling the person that very thing. And you say, Harry, look, it's really uncomfortable for me to say this, but you know, when you're playing the saxophone on the roof at three in the morning, and I'm trying to go to work at 5.30, it's not feasible, it's not tenable. It's not fair. So when you've got to let somebody down or when you've got to change the plan, you start by telling them how uncomfortable it is for you to let them down. Because let's face it, sometimes you're just not going to be able to make the appointment. Sometimes you're not going to be able to deliver on your promise. And mm -hmm. that happens all the time. So we're looking to become as natural as possible. Less ego driven, less intense, less sacrificial of the animals, less inane you know, less television, more walking in the forest, and more silence, more introspection. And hey, if you're living in a busy life, you may only get 15 minutes of silence every day. But hey, walk out on the lawn in your knickers and look at the moon and be silent. How do you feel about how evolving your own integrity plays into evolving your own spirit? It's very important because when a person lies, they're essentially fostering a fake self and it's often usually linked into importance, their image, and how they're trying to convince you. But then also, it comes to this concept of specialness. You know, they see themselves as special, so they don't have to have integrity. It's like, well, I'm so special, I don't really have to be honest. And specialness is a death avoidance mechanism. So when you see specialness in, say, rock stars or politicians or whatever, they're terribly important people, it's how they elevate themselves from death. Because the fate of the common man is to die, you know, maybe in pain or to starve, where all the superior beings, in theory, are distanced from death because they're very special. So they're in the limousine, on the red carpet, blah, 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 in the VIP lounge. And so all of that self-importance is essentially death avoidance. 
So a lot of that integrity, integrity thing is masking, is masking the lie of their specialness. They have to convince you that they're spiritual when deep down they may as yet still have problems that they haven't faced. So it's really easy to get very distracted in this world. And a lot of people, they feel like they don't accomplish their goals because of this or because of that. Yes. And um, what do you see as one of the primary causes for people that just floundering along? Well, a lot of it's to do with confusion. And confusion is a disease that affects billions of people. And so what I say is you cure confusion by not asking questions because you cannot be confused without asking a question first. Shall I, shan't I, will I, won't I, what if, what's going to happen next month, or next year? You know, you have to be in the, in the now and don't ask questions. And then the other way you get less scattered is to want less and less and less. When you get down to the point of not wanting anything, not yearning for things, not being miserable because you've got this but you want that, then suddenly all that zigzag ends. There's a concept in Taoism called Wu Wei, which is like a non, it's essentially non-action. It states that the Tao will find you, it'll come to you. Okay, yeah, maybe you've got to print some brochures, maybe you've got to go out to a meeting, but the, it's the tension and the stress of, of a trying to achieve stuff that doesn't work. And it becomes like Oedipus's crow, it hops up the road in front of you, you can never catch up with it. Your goals and your dreams are constantly avoiding you. Just when you get close, it jumps. So the, the thing to do is to bring it back and bring it back inside yourself and know that you're adequate and know that you have the ability to materialize your dreams and get out of confusion, stop asking questions, just be. And then you do have to do concerted things in the marketplace if your goals are career, money and so forth. One last topic, since we're, we're talking about doing things to influence your own reality and your own outcome. Yeah. Ever since the, the film The Secret came out, there's this whole thing about manifest this and create your own reality. And yeah. then, you know, physicists are saying, well, maybe there's a certain amount of, of malleability to the universe that enables us to do that. What's your take on, on how much of our own external reality we can create, how much uh, we can influence the world around us to, to create outcomes that, that are favorable to our goals? Yeah, you can't influence other people without becoming like a black magician if you have desires for them. Even if the desires are innocuous, you're not allowed to do that. You have to allow them to be. But you can certainly influence your reality by resonating at a high level. and. Um, you essentially push out and pull in. So what I tell people is like blow love at people in the street. Just very soft. Blow love at your goals, the things that you want. Blow love at your relatives and allow the divine order to sort it all out for you because it will. I mean, that is the eternal Tao. It'll work it all out. And, um, you know, the milk chucker hit the mother-in-law and you're free. You see, it'll work, it'll all be fine. It'll all be fine on the night. And um, so I think that you are definitely intimately connected to creating your own reality. There's no question of it. Like, I don't believe in accidents. I don't believe in chance. I think everything that happens to you in your life is an external manifestation of some sentiment or some deep-seated karma that's inside of you. The, uh, when the principles first became mainstream, it was the idea that you could create your own reality by a process of thought, action, belief, yes. alignment with the, uh, with the universe. Um, and it's kind of evolved into an idea that you don't, you're manifesting every day and you don't have to manifest and, as in create it because in a lot of ways it's already there. It is already there. It's already there. It's like the book's already written, the film's already made. The baby's already born. It's true. It's already there. And so and, when people understand that, do you think that it gives them a, a, a greater amount of personal ability? I think it would because it calms them down and also it stops that frenetic wanting. You know, it's already there and hey, you've got to be patient. It'll be there when you need it. So really at the end of the day, it's choosing to live in a world that's made up of synchronicity, that's made up of, of literal magic, that's made up of things that will astound you every day at the wonder that, that creates them. And it's, yeah. it's being open to that and realizing that, that that's the kind of place we're in. 
Yeah, it's like choosing a heaven world or choosing a hell world. You choose. You get what you want. You pay your money and you get what you want, or what you don't want, you know. But you, yeah, that's absolutely. It's like if you go for the celestial, if you go for the divine, if you go for calm, if you go for the sensibilities I talked about, then it's bound to be beautiful, you know. I love that quote from the film. I can't remember the name of the film. You probably remind me, but that quote that says, um, "It'll all be all right in the end, and if it's not all right now, it can't be the end." It's, it's that movie, I think it's called something like The Magnificent Magnolia Hotel or something. I can't remember the name of the movie, but wow. it's such a sweet quote, you know, because, hey, yeah, we live in a state of divine perfection, so it will be right in the end. And in the meantime, we might have to work towards making it right, perfectly right in the end, you know. So we have a beauty and we have a calm or a journey and that residence, who you are, goes out further and further and further, the wider you get. But you have to be soft, you have to be tender, you have to be forgiving of yourself and others. You have to be non-judgmental. You can't bitch and moan and fight. You can't be a predator. You have to have the three graces, tenderness, generosity, and respect. And that's just a foundation from which all the garden will grow. All the garden will grow, yeah. There's no question of it. Stuart, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you.